coming up. First gun celebrate. In eighth grade, I was talking to a gun. You know, I was I was actually going to shoot somebody in eighth grade, to be honest with you. You, know? you were going to shoot somebody in eighth grade. eighth grade? Yeah, I got locked up like five times, to be honest. Whoa. I was in a cell with a guy who killed 13 people. And he actually had tell me everything. Over the years, I've written for, for Bounty Killer. I've written for The Angel, I've written for Ghost, I've written for Lady G, I've written for Loot and Fire, you know, I've written for Danny Boo, I've written for Prodigal Son, I've written for Sai from Diana, I've done that right in my years. Hi everyone, so this week on The Trailblazers, we have the riveting story of a young man who was arrested five times and at the age of 13 years old was given a gun to kill someone. Well, today he has turned his life around. His name is Andrew Fox. He's the author of this book, The Power of Pain, My Pain, My Breakthrough. Tune in to find out how is it that he managed to transform his life. Today is also not only an author, but a recording artist and a songwriter. What did he do? And of course, his rules for success and his advice to persevere and to never let nobody write you up. When people write you up, all you have to do is just go right off his Stay tuned. Some of our most prominent producers mm -hmm. in the industry tell Tony that he could not bust a female artist because wow. your feeling is one thing. Feeling publicly is, is, a, is a very hard thing. My father always said he was growing a prime minister. Had I said I was all in my mouth, the lies were going, and I put, I sat and I saw women on the TV just lying bluntly, just just like that. Police the all media survey, when they look at the name Ron Mushek, zero, what? zero, zero. And then they send back to say that they apologize. The lady up there never put in the number. Seriously? Um, in terms then, of help, help or like house cleaning. Yeah, my mom was a yeah, my mom was a helper back then and stuff. To be honest, I was just excited. You know, to play for us to finish. I did it and I made my move into entrepreneurship at 40. What, you know, last comments would you want to share with you? You have your core values, you do the right things, it'll fall in place for you. So this week on The Trailblazers, I am delighted that we have with us Andrew Fawkes. No, he has quite a phenomenal story. He's actually the author of this book, The Power of Pain my pain, my breakthrough, and I'll, I'll do a, a, a larger showing of it. But yes, yeah, so he's actually the author of that book, and he has quite an interesting story, which I'm going to let him share, of course. So we want to find out how he managed to change his life and transform his life and get on the path to success. Hi, Andrew. It is a pleasure to have you on the Trailblazers. Hey, what's up? Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being here. You are welcome. All right, so I started reading your book and trust me, I I was so, cause it's an easy reader. It's not, it's not a big book, but the, your story was so compelling. I was like, I have to, you know, I have to have this talk with you on the program. So for our viewers, tell us about your early years. I understand that you went to, you, you know, you went to prison a couple of times as well. But before we even reach that point, Tell us about your early years because from the book you start you grew up in a middle class family you went to prep school and all of that so yeah i don't understand what happened all right so i basically i grew up in i grew up between kingston and clarendon really my father was residing in clarendon you know, so i spent most of my, my childhood years living with my father and my step you know we grew up in a, on a farm known as the adc farm which was an export farm in Canada. Um, it was me, it was my brothers, and we had a sister, Tasha. Um, we went to prep school. My father was a farmer, but he was very big on giving us the best start. And so as a farmer, he decided to send us to prep school. On holidays, though, I'd you know, go to Kingston to visit my mom, who was actually living in Mountain. So uh, my early years was mostly in Canada. Um, I went to St. Thomas my preparatory school where I was in football. I was playing football from for the prep school. I was playing for the parish of Clarendon. Um, I won my first um, national competition in grade five, which was an essay competition also. Yeah, it was it was a very humble beginning. Um, I had a father who I never see. He didn't go to church at all, but on Sundays, he made it his point that he was to bring me and my brothers to church every Sunday morning. 
and pick us up. He was very strict, extremely strict. We could have been said dance or something, no matter. He was very strict. My father was one of those men who pressed him in him jeans. Yeah. So, oh. yeah. Very militant. All right. So, I mean, and um, I'm wondering then at what point, because when I, when I touched um, your book, it mentioned the fact that despite all of that, you, you had a bit of feeling of neglect not having your mom around. All right. So that really, yes, I, I was, growing up, I wasn't the type of, the type of child who was talkative. I was very, um, you know, I wasn't, one who would socialize with other people. Um, I grew up with a lot of bitterness, but it wasn't shared. You know, um, I'm not sure as to what it was, you know, but there was always a bad energy with my mom and my mom. And I think that spilled over on me. So I wasn't getting the best of treatment, you know, if my father was getting the best of treatment from my stepmother. And um, I think I was always called and beat and do everything where my brothers would be outside playing. You know, it was always me doing everything, whatever it is to do. You know, it was always me who had to do it. And so I am. I was born on the 6th of January. My brother, my younger brother was born on the 7th. And what she would normally do, you know, my stepmother would normally, she, she does everything on his birthday. So, you know, today will be my birthday and nothing is done. No cake, no, nothing at all. Wow. But then tomorrow, which is Adrian's birthday, she does everything. So wow. much so, you know, she and my father actually got married at Adrian's birthday. And oh, for wow. year, my birthday on the 7th of January. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it was something that I, I grew, you know, I started to grow a bit. And I love my siblings, but the relationship with my stepmother is that to, to, you know, I just wanted to be around my mother. My mother was like my, my hero, my best friend. You know, everybody. she was working in Kingston. And she was a superman. I only get to see her on holidays. Yeah, I was the type of child when my mother, when I was spending the, the summer with her, and she would drop me back off you know, for school. Yeah, I'd cry when she leave. You know, when she leave, and I'd, yeah, everybody knows that once I'm going to leave, you might go cry. I'm a, and I'm going to cry for two weeks. Because that was like the only safe place for me. You know, my mom was like, you know, my safe place. And the whole energy with my mother also. Um, as I say, I was doing everything in the house. The only break I got was in the night. So once the light is turned on, you know, I feel like that, that was that peace of mind for me. Like the following day. And to this day, what I do is I can't sleep what there's like up to this day. Like, um, I, I love darkness very much because it, it, it still it still brings out that feel of there is no more calling on Andrew, there is no more, you know, stress hunting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So for me, if I'm chilling I, I, at home, I prefer the host being the full dark up to this day. Okay. And I don't like, I don't go in the kitchen at all, I don't like cooking right now because I've done, you know, I was doing a lot of, you know, growing up, it was always me. Having to wash dishes, cook to do everything. So right now, I don't, I don't want to the kitchen. Wow, 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 Andrew. Um, that is, and I mean, one could understand though why you would feel that way because for your stepmom to do that, that's that was not nice, you know. So you can understand the impact that would have had on you as a young child. So at what point now? Because I know you went to Clarendon College, right? And that's a traditional school here in Jamaica. So, I mean, congratulations. Uh, despite the fact of how you were feeling as a youngster, being able to accomplish that, you know, I'm sure your family was was very proud. Yes, I was always an above average child as in Mr. Academics. You know, I was I was excelling in, in sports while in prep school, but always a, an above average child. So um, the GS at that my average in GSA was something like five. So Clarendon College was actually my first choice school. So I asked my GSA definitions for Clarendon College. Um managed to hold seven and eight grade year because as I say, being bitter and searching for, you know, for a sense of belonging when I started high school, I, I was around the wrong road. You know, I found myself young while in seventh grade. I started holding guns. You know, so I held my first gun in seventh grade. Um, and I, I think it was just though um, seven and eight grade for me in high school was like I was 
I didn't know. I, I went to maybe three classes, if any. It was I found a family in a, in the wrong set of people. You know, I had a cousin who, who was a part of a gang. And as his little cousin, I was, you know, back into the gang also. And, you know, I felt safe, you know, I'm safe. And, you know, that saw me you know, through everything but that they were doing. So, as I said, it was guns, it was knives, it was just everything. You know, I was in fights, I was got to hurt people. In eighth grade, I was starting a gun. You know, I was, I was actually going to shoot somebody in eighth grade, to be honest with you. You, know, you were going to shoot was, somebody in eighth grade. In eighth grade. So I was seen with the gun. And it was reported that I had to leave the camps. Um, cops were looking for me. And so I had to leave home in the morning. It's like I was actually going to school, but I really was not going to school. So I was actually hiding in a mango tree for three weeks. You know, wow. and school for my father. And, you know, that's how that went and stuff. But then I was doing like, so I went to see a doctor because I have been constant migraines. And I just went back. All I wanted to do was to leave with my mother. So if they don't let me go live with my mother, I was going to continue to live with my And I just would, I, I was really fed up of what I was experiencing at home. And I just decided that if I'm not going to live with my mother, then I'm going to do everything. But... Wow. But that part, though, is a very interesting. The fact that you were in a gang and you know, in eighth grade for those who may be overseas, he, you would probably would be like about 14 years old at the time, right? Yeah, I think I was like 13 because I started high school, you know. Oh, so you're like 13? So I was like 13 at the time. Wow. So imagine at 13 years old, you have a gun on you and you're prepared to kill somebody. And that, of course, was because of the influence of the gang that you were in, right? As you mentioned. Yeah, the influence of the gang mixed with what I was experiencing, you know, the neglect, you know, the rejection. It was just everything. Um, I felt, you know, I just wanted to free myself up. And I found a family in the gang. Really. So, you know, that's okay. because I, the decision was then made at the end of eight grade to for me to go and live with mom. And so uh, in ninth grade, I started Excelsior High School. <clears throat> you know, I moved with mom in Kingston and I started Excelsior High School there. And, you know, the, the thing that I do is that over the years, I, went, I only saw my mom on holidays. So we didn't really know how to socialize with each other. You know, I knew my, I knew my mom loved me and I know that I love her really much, but because I wasn't living with her over the years, you know, being, you know, transitioning to living with her, you know, I do I think we didn't know how we really to relate to each other, you know, so it was mostly good morning. That's how we really said, uh, you know, uh, my mom was a nurse, so it was me and my little sister. Um, I just started exit high school and, you know, I just made a decision that I was going to try my utmost best to not let her know. And so what I did while at Excelsior you know, was to not go back to that gang life or to that life where it's filled with weapons, you know, I, I started to focus more on my musical talents, which was something that I had, you know, right through my life. So it was all music for me in Excelsior. I started writing songs. And I started clashing in the school, so I became a teacher. It was a nice one. Wow, so music definitely was therapeutic for you and also helped you, you know, to, to deal with, well, yeah, therapeutic helped you to deal with the situation that you were facing at that time. So, okay, so explain to me now, um, because you have shared, you know, in previous conversations and it's, it's in your book, about you um, going to prison, being incarcerated. So share with us what happened. You don't have to go into all of the details, but what, what transpired the first time and how many times actually have you been incarcerated? Um, so, okay. Well, that's really up, further up in my journey. But, um, so after I finished Excelsior, after I finished high school, 
right? Um, I was actually doing a law program, which was a short program between Excel and College and um, I did one year and I stopped and I started to focus on music. Uh, in 2013, you know, I, I, I I was seeing moderate success in dance at the time, really. And I, I found, you know, two really rotating songs on radio. Um, I was doing interviews and shows um, and stuff like that. I was around the wrong group in Twitter during that time. Because while as a while a dancer, I guess people would say that I've been a star the virus cartel. You know, they would normally say that I have a, like, a vibes cartel and, you know, we, we share basically similar birthdays and stuff like that. That led to me, you know, having a, a gunman around me, you know, entourage-wise when it comes to music. And there's a particular night when I was going to a performance and we had like six illegal guns in the car. Yeah. You know, there was one, there was another night when I was actually at the studio and they came to pick me up and we went to chill where we went and I had like, there was like a hundred points around me that night. That particular night, the night I decided to leave that, I had like 100 points around me that night. Wow. My, my spouse at the time was pregnant with my daughter, so that night I really had to see what I I just, I was just thinking it through and I was saying like, at this rate, I don't think that my daughter Maybe I'd drop out before, you know, she, you know, she's born. Uh, even if she was born, I saw her do that I had to live, you know, long. So I made a decision that night. You know, I was going to just walk away from this life. In 2014, after that experience that night, I decided I was going to walk away from Dancer. You know, I wanted to see my daughter, for one. You know, I knew the type of father that I wanted to be. And live that life was it wasn't conducive for family, so I decided to walk away from that. Um, however, struggles came on after I left that side, and that's when I started to I got locked up like five times. To be honest. Whoa, um, that's a lot for a young man. So I mean, those occasions generally had to do with um having illegal firearms. No, you know, it wasn't really illegal firearms. It was. So nothing could have been pinned, really, you know what I mean? So nothing what? Was, nothing what? Nothing was, nothing was really pinned. You know, so there was no charges against me and stuff like that. So I can't say it was illegal fire. The last time I got locked up, it was very serious. Because I remember they, they, they told me that day that you know, I'm not until around 18 years. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Specifically, the, the, the police, the officer looked at me and he said, you know, see what you're at the boy, 18 years time, you know. That part, and it was a Saturday. I was there like six days. And I remember one morning, I just heard my name called. And I was told to get up. But for five years, I kept on having this dream that I was in a cell with eight guys. And I was actually encouraging them for five years. I was having that dream. For and five, the last time, for five years. For five years, dream. And the last time I got locked up, I was actually in a cell with eight guys, <laughs> and oh. I was the one. Um, and I was the one who was actually encouraging them. I was in a cell with a guy who killed thirteen people, and he actually had told me everything. You know, and so yeah, man, it was. Intense. I think, yeah, it was. But during the six days that I was in, you know, I started to write and all that stuff. And one morning I just heard my name called, you know, she so should take my stuff and come. And that was it. The officer said me that name said, bro, if I'm not you can't sleep. I don't know how officer said what? I'm so I'm lock you up, I can't sleep. Yeah, so in, in actually just, I just, I was just released. And I never looked back from there and I said that that was it. That was it, you know. Whoa, yeah. that is amazing. But to think like, wow, five times. And then the, the part about the dream too. So you never once thought that it was, because you're a spiritual person as well, that it was a premonition. I knew it was going to happen, you know, because every time I got the dream, I got like, I would put this level of fear over me, like, yo, this is going to happen for real, you know. 
you know, it's like God telling us that I want you to go to Nineveh and Jonah say, I'm not going to go to the market. It was, yeah, man, every, every time I got the dream, I got scared. I woke up scared and it was just, it was just a reoccurring dream. So I just knew that at one point, that's why the day that I got locked up last time, I wasn't scared, you know. I wasn't worried, even when they say oh, 18 years and stuff, I was just really, I was crying, but I was really just chill, because I said, if this go happen, if it go happen, it go happen, so what I did. Wow. And, um, I came out and I decided that I'm not going back. That is amazing. That is... <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of speechless there. So, all right. So you said that last time, that fifth time when you came out, you never, you know, went back. I mean, you, as in you turn your life around, what, what was the cause of it in that moment? You know, or what, what, what led up to you deciding that, listen, me not come back here, so, you know, like, this is it for me. Understanding my purpose. Understanding? Under Repeat that. Under it was understanding my purpose. You know, it was it was understanding that you know, there was a lot of times when personally I knew that I should have died. You know? Yes. I have friends who I par with every day. Like at six of my friends died in three months. And God kept on spreading me. Why am I here? Why is everybody who I was associated with, you know, kept on dying? Like everybody kept on dying but I was here. I was just always here. You know, it had to be a greater purpose. And just, just realizing my purpose. You know, it, it, my story is it's not to kill me. It's, to, it's for me to, to share and to bring some form of inspiration and to be some form of motivation to someone. You know, so it was just appreciating first the purpose and understanding my journey. And once you do that, you develop, you develop great appreciation for yourself. You know what I mean? So, that was really it. Wow. Um, I continue. Yeah, my daughter also. My daughter would be like that. Your daughter. Um, that's it. My daughter. No, nobody else. No mother, nobody, my daughter. That's awesome. And I like that part in terms of yeah, like understanding your purpose because you came to that realization, Andrew. And I saw in your book where you mentioned as well, you you know, have also turning to God like what was yeah what happened where you realized that god god was your your help in that time of trouble so actually i grew up in church you know um even though i did all that i did you know i i grew up in church so i always had to see how that you know what i mean so um turning to god it wasn't hard or nothing that i had to you know think hard about it was transitioning to dance and then you know, decided that I work with God. And you know, that was it. But I'm not a person right now where I'm just about having a personal relationship with him, you know. You know, I've been through stuff in church. So I am personally right in a place where I focus on my relationship with him. Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't let no one dictate how I should live or what I should do from that group. You know, I focus on my personal relationship with you. And that's so crucial. That's so powerful because you're right. I mean, church people, they're not perfect either. So you really can't look to people for that validation or for that help. It really has, you have to have that personal, that individual relationship. So I, I really do appreciate you authentically speaking. All right. So now after such an interesting journey, Today, not only you are um, an author penning your first book, but you're an also, well, you've always loved music from day one, as you told us. And so as an artist, a, a singer, um, yeah, tell us about that. Tell us about why you decided to, to write this book. You know, the power, the power of pain, my pain, my breakthrough. What? Yeah, you have it. What led you down that path? So... I got title in 2018. I was sleeping, literally, I was sleeping. I woke up around 2 a.m. with this title in my head, Power of Pain. Um, I just got a title. I wrote the title. That's it. Um, I woke up before the day, this summer, so Power of Pain. Wow. But it was not until last year that 
I decided that I was going to write a book. And it was just a rough period in my life. My mother was disconnected for like three months. I had no life for over three months. I owed maybe 100,000 rent. It was either you're going to play dead or you're going to run away. And I just sat on my veranda and I decided to write it. And I was stopped writing from it. You know, and the book really signifies perseverance. You know, so any matter you that shoot from the book is perseverance. You know, it is seeing all that I went through from her, from pain, from rejection, you know, being locked up. Just everything that I've gone through, even financially, and just understanding that I never gave up. You know, I was always holding out. I was always, always finding a way, trying to find a way. And for me, the power of it, it is finding that last drop in a strength to push forward when giving up is the easiest thing to do. You know, so when you reach that point in your life when you just want to throw in the double, the power of pain really just finding the last job of strength to just fight on one more day, even when giving up just the easiest thing to do. You know, that's the power of pain means for me. Wow, that is so powerful. I, I love that. All right, so we are winding down, but I mean, as an artist, I can't let you not come on the program and even but drop a one lyric, a one line you know maybe something at one of one of your songs or because i also understand that you also have written for a number of popular people i i, I don't know if you're if you're able to share yes i've written uh, over the years i've written for for bone tequila i've written for the angel i've written for ghost i've written for lady g i've written for loot and fire you know i've written for danny boo i've written for prodigal son I've written for Cycle from Guyana. I've done that all right in my years. You know, and I've been doing my work. Um, I've done commercials also for places like Ireland and Ireland, another place. And yeah. Um, when I was writing a book, and I was telling someone that I was writing a book, they learned because they don't have tattoos. And they were saying, you don't look like an author. And I said, so oh, what art is supposed to look? You know, art are supposed to have on the glasses, you know, in the mid 40s, in the big belly. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I never look at a typical art. But writing the book as a tattooed flag, you know, still searching and still trying to find his way, young man, it only shows one. And it really shows that one come to the ghetto, one book. Out and the echo, the whole shot of being not no work, keep the stress up on the be We put the flows and the metaphors. Life no sweet, and no rose and no ketchup. Different hurdles, every road. Step far of time like a pro. Some may get up, dry up. Some may wet up, tired. Some are fed up, no. Hurt red now. Eating a earth, youths only in our streets now. Now I've got church, so them no farming, no hard work, but they life, they might live, make them got past their church. Sunday morning, past our search, everybody walk past church, now I've got work. Few shot fire, no one nurse, nurse call, doctor, doctor call, one nurse, no. Church, we nothing, everybody grieving, hoping, reaching. Ah, yeah, man. Ah, oh, matting. Matting, I love it. And I know. It would even be clearer because we are, you know, having this uh, discussion via um, obviously Zoom. So I know it would even sound even crisper and clearer when Andrew is in studio or in person. So we just want to put that disclaimer, but it definitely sounds good, Andrew. All right. So my final uh, comment to you, by the way, congratulations again on your book. And I am imploring everybody to get it. So before I, I let you tell people how they can get a copy of your book, you have shared just a little part, you know, because it's so much even more powerful, but you share just a glimpse into your phenomenal story. And unfortunately, we're at a time, especially here in Jamaica, where gangs have, you know, or young men are turning to gangs in droves. And as you mentioned, from you were a little boy, you know, you were part of a gang and had a gun and was about to kill somebody. But luckily, you didn't. So, I mean, what would you want to share as a word of advice? One, to other young men that also may be feeling lost and have turned to gang and to criminal activity to, to feel a sense of belonging. What would, you, what would you want to say to them? And two, what would you generally want to say to our viewers 
in terms of not letting your past define you but pushing forward all right so to to, to young to young men like myself um i think i started parenting because i think what what made me you know turn my life around was the saying train up a child in the way he should grow and when he gets old he will not depart from it so when it says train up a child in the way he should grow it doesn't mean that the child won't differ right so even while she when you train that child up the child may you know come off track but at some point he's going to come to that realization that i was not grown up this way i was not brought up this way right so i think preparing is Sundays now is like it. One, as I say, I never see my father go to a church until my grandmother died, right? But he always brought to church every Sunday morning, Sunday school. Both my both parents, even when I was around my mother, I had to go to church. I have to go to church. Parents know leave the child up, you know, the children up to anything. So you have a child, you know, whether or not you go to church on Sunday as a child. You don't get that choice, my mother or father, until you are 18. And I think if we don't go back to that place as parents where, you know, we let dance out to our children, you know, girls going out to parties and clubs before 16. So where, the, where Jamaica is right now, it had to be like that because of the parenting. I think that's really the downfall. So it has to be a change in parenting, right? And in terms of youth, so feel lost. Um, personally, yeah, it's not the answer, right? Um, blind can't lead blind, as the mother said. So, you feeling lost and going around lost people to, fit, to find a way makes no sense, right? So, feel lost, find a pastor, find somebody where you must have one person who makes sense and can talk to. Because we are cultured as men to be much of, you know, we're supposed to express emotions or emotional concerns. But real men can do that. You are not a real man when you, when you suppress. You are a real man when you express. So learn to express concerns, emotional concerns. You know, take your mental health very seriously. You know, if you realize that you are going in a state of depression, talk to somebody about it. It doesn't matter who finds somebody to talk to them about it. And the viewers out there, um, I've been somebody who has been, I've been written off for everybody. I've been told that I wasn't going to come to nothing at all. I've been told that I was, and I'm not going to be anything, nothing successful. Like, I've been told the worst of stuff. But I believe one thing. When people write you off, all you have to do is just don't write off yourself. So when the world write you off, you just don't write off yourself. Right? Yes, somebody had to climb the mountain for us to know the mountain had peaks. The mountain had peaks, you know. Somebody had to climb that mountain, right? And even so, you knew the race was not for this. That's my life. Month. So it's not that. Not everybody will have that Asafa will perfect start, right? You don't have to have Asafa start. Just have that you see and will finish. Oh, a man of and a young man at that of very fine but wise and very critical words. Thank you so much, Andrew, folks. I really appreciate that. Such a phenomenal story. And I love that part where you mentioned that people may write you off, but you make sure that you don't write off yourself. And I mean, I, I that resonates with me. So thank you so much. Keep blazing your trail. Oh. And where can persons uh, get copies of your book? Okay, so right now I'm sending parties for persons in Jamaica. All you have to do is just call me um, at 876-237-4447. So that's 876-237-4447. And place your orders. Or you can find me on Instagram and DM me, which is Bliss Shell Shell. That's B-L-A-I-Z-E Shell Shell S-H-E-L-L in a DM for copies and for persons overseas just go on Amazon and type the power of pain by Andrew Fuchs and you can get it in Kindle or paperback. Awesome. Thank you so much Andrew. It has been a pleasure and I mean I I know 
we had a little bit of technicalities, but you know, it was a fantastic interview. I'm so proud of you. Keep blazing your trail, being an example to us as you know, young people. And um, yeah, congrats on your book. And yeah, keep just keep pushing forward. You have excellence written all over you. Thank you so much. Thanks much for having me. Be blessed, man. Cheers, sure. Hey everyone, I am Tamara McHale, television and radio presenter, producer, communication specialist, and of course, producer and host of the Trailblazers series. I'm inviting you, yes, you, to join our family. All you have to do is just click the subscribe button right below. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you are alerted as to when we have new episodes. And then join our family for weekly inspiring episodes that will not only lift your spirits, but give you the tools, the keys, and the strategies that you need so that you can walk in your purpose and blaze your trail. Thanks for watching.